If you've heard me ramble about films before, or for very long, you will know or learn quickly that I'm a fan of spaghetti westerns, Italian westerns of the 1960s, 1970s. They just had a style and a sensibility and a weirdness that I love. And Arrow Video, once again, comes out with a box set filled with Italian westerns that for the most part, most of us who love Italian westerns have never heard of, and that's exciting. I always say, or I said recently to a friend, uh, no matter how many Italian Westerns I've seen, and I've seen a lot, it's nice to know internally, I have peace of mind knowing that no matter how many I watch, there's always at least another 400 out there that I've never heard of that are waiting for me to see. So here we have uh, Savage Guns, Four Classic Italian Westerns, Volume 3. This is the third, if you could, couldn't tell by the number three, this is the third set that Arrow has put out of relatively to us and to me obscure Italian Westerns with excellent transfers and phenomenal extras. And let's just dive in. This is gonna be a long one. So uh, grab yourself a cookie and a cushion because uh, I'm gonna go as in-depth as my memory will allow on these. So disc one, I Want Him Dead. That, that's the title of the film. I'm not making a proclamation. I'm from 1968, I Want Him Dead, directed by Paolo Bianchini and starring Craig Hill, who was an American actor, and uh, Lea Massari. It's 87 minutes long. It is presented in the Italian version, and they do this on a lot of these, which is really cool. The Italian version, which has Italian audio and titles on screen, or the English version, which has English audio and English titles, but uh, they're the same running times on these. Sometimes they do differ, and I'll tell you as we go if they do. So basically the story here, as my notes over there tell me, uh, in the waning days of the Civil War, uh, our hero, portrayed by Craig Hill, uh, his, his Clayton, his name, his sister is murdered by two like creeps who run off into the, into the distance and he goes to hunt them down to make them pay. And it turns out these two creeps were hired by a wealthy munitions baron to basically kill Generals Lee and Grant, together both, uh, when they prepare to, when they're meeting for a, a a meeting to, to decide the terms of the surrender and things like that. So hoping the idea is that the munitions baron is paying these guys to kill Lee and Grant so that each side will think the other side did it and continue the Civil War and thus profit from the munitions that he manufactures. This is basically a Bond plot. That was the plot of more than a couple of the James Bond films was Blofeld or Spectre or some guy is trying to cause a war between the U.S. and Russia and profit off that when you know neither of them really had anything to do with it. So that's the basic idea here, and uh, it was it was interesting. It was it looks gorgeous, looks amazing. It uh, really gritty, a good gritty revenge film. And uh, the funny enough, the lead in the film reminded me uh, of a young Rip Torn. At it, certain certain looks he gave, I was like, it looks like if, if Rip Torn was in a spaghetti western, he might look something like that. So uh, extras, we have a commentary by Adrian J. Smith and David Flint. We have Dead or Alive, an introduction to the film by uh, journalist and critic Fabio Melelli, who does a lot of these. That's 13 minutes. You have The Man Who Hated Violence. It's kind of funny interview with the director, Paolo Bianchini, and that's 30 minutes. Cut and shoot interview with the editor, Eugenio Alabasio. That is 17 minutes. The Nico Unchained archival interview with composer Nico Fidenko, 21 minutes. English theatrical trailer is three minutes. Very stylish, um, color tinted, wordless combination of like shots from the movie and stills from the film uh, set to the theme song, which is kind of cool. Uh, 26 image image gallery. It's mostly the German lobby card set where the film was sold as a Django film. If you don't know about that, Franco Nero made this film called Django, which was incredibly popular. And it was so popular that endless films for the next decade, at least, would call themselves Django, even if Franco Nero wasn't in them, even if they weren't about a character named Django, they would throw that on the poster so people would go see it. And this, uh, this rears its head again later on this set. That's disc one. We're gonna rip through these for, just to give you a sense of what's on this set. Disc two is El Puro. 1969, directed by Eduardo Mulgaria with Robert Woods and Rosalba Neri, who you may know from Lady Frankenstein and a lot of Italian films. Always a welcome presence. When I saw that Rosalba Neri was in this, I got all excited. I'm like, ooh, somebody I know and somebody I like. The uh, two versions of the film, there is the 108-minute Italian version and 108-minute, uh, maybe maybe my timings are wrong on this. This is the Italian version and the hybrid version. Uh, there are extra scenes in the longer Italian version from an archival print, some with Spanish audio, which helps, to me, it doesn't really bother me because it helps me tell 
which scenes weren't in the original version. Like if you ever watch the extended version of Argento's Deep Red, it's, it was never dubbed in English in its full form. So suddenly it reverts to Italian with English subtitles. And that's how you know, oh, this stuff wasn't in the version that we got here. Some people can find it distracting, but uh, I don't, it doesn't bother me. Um, okay, I see here. 108 minutes, uh, it was either the original Italian and English version is uh, 98 minutes. So you get the English version, 98, Italian version, 98, extended hybrid, 108. So it's 10 minutes longer. There is an English uh, SDH subtitles that's for the uh, deaf and hard of hearing. So it's subtitles that are the film in English, but also any sounds or music or anything are, are mentioned in those subtitles. Um, the, the transfer looks unbelievably good, as do all of these. It always gets me when these films can be released that are decades and decades old, and they just don't look old. I mean, they look old in that, you know, some of these actors aren't alive, or sometimes the clothes look don't look, if it's a, not a period piece, the clothes of the day don't look new. But a lot of times you can watch these things, and it's like, wow, this looks like it was shot yesterday. So the basic idea is there's a criminal gang rides into town and finds a wanted poster for El Puro, who happens to be holed up in the uh, local saloon slash flop house. It's, he's a hopeless alcoholic, looked after by saloon gal, madam, uh, prostitute. I, I used a slang term in there. Not an offensive slang term, just a prostitute gets it across better. Uh, by, played by Rizal Benieri. Once he sees the guys are coming for him, he decides to right his ship and face them. So it's there is sequences of, I don't know if you call them training sequences, but there are sequences of him basically practicing his mastery of, of, of the pistols again and trying to, you know, get back on the wagon and uh, be able to fight these guys off when the time comes. It's a strangely psychological and kind of slow for the genre, I found. It's more about the the characters and their wounded psyches than it really is action. There is action in it, but it's much more of a thinking spaghetti western, which is kind of cool. I like variety. Uh, very Mostly quiet and brooding. Uh, keeps the titular character off screen for the first half hour. Uh, the score by Aless Alessandro Alessandroni is very... Ennio Morricone, a uh, fistful of dollars, but but still catchy. And they actually get into that in one of the extras where they say it feels like it rips off the dollars movies, but Alessandroni had a lot to do with those scores, apparently, that Morricone did for the Leone trilogy. So maybe it's 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 valid if like one of the co-authors kind of uses what they've done before. Um, so let's see what I have. Yeah, there's a kid actor in the film who apparently would go on to become an infamous terrorist in Italy. And they get into that in the commentary and the extras on this. But he's this cute kid actor who late, late, late in life became uh, a Red Brigade kind of super right-wing terrorist blowing things up and, <laughs> and going to jail for quite a long period of time. So the extras on this, the commentary by Troy Howarth and Nathaniel Thompson, they're always great. They always give you a ton of background information about everybody in the film and the genre and the film's release and the historical period the film is set in. But also, I, mean, I won't say they make fun of it, but they take a movie for what it is and they have fun with it sometimes, never to a degree that offends me. And I tend to get offended when people don't take a movie seriously. If they're just, I don't, I don't want to listen to a commentary if you're just mocking the film for the whole time, which these guys don't, which is great. Uh, a Zen Western movie, intro by journalist and critic, again, Fabio Bellelli, 15 minutes. A real Italian interview with star Robert Woods that is 28 minutes long and he's an American which is kind of cool. Uh, just kind of cool that, I mean, obviously we knew that they used Americans in spaghetti westerns, but more often than not, the Italian westerns would take Italian actors and anglicize their names to make Italians and or the world think it was an American actor starring in them, even if it was an American actor whose name you'd never heard of. More than just a western, it's an in-depth appreciation of composer Alessandro Alessandroni's music and by musician and disc collector Lovely John. His stuff is always great where he really gets into the history of the composers that did the scores for various films and gets into the various releases that they did. And then they go sort of almost sometimes cut by cut of the tracks in the film. It's really cool. That's a half hour. Disc three of four, Wrath of the Wind, which I actually watched last night. So this one is the freshest. It's taken me a long time to watch this set. So this one's the freshest in my mind. Wrath of the Wind, which was retitled Trinity Sees Red from 1970. This was released technically before my, Trinity is My Name or My Name is Trinity that was made with Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer that was this huge like comedy Western hit. Um, this movie is not a comedy by any stretch of the imagination. It was released before Trinity, but as was the case, which I admire those rapscallions back then, as was the case. Trinity comes out is a huge hit. The uh, This other company has this movie that stars the star of Trinity, who's real popular now. So they create a new poster with Terrence Hill, making it look fun and happy. And they put the Trinity name on it and they put the Trinity title at the beginning of the film. But otherwise, it's the same movie that is not a comedy and really not fun. 
Not in a bad way, but I'm saying this is a pretty serious film. So this was directed by Mario Camas, a Spanish director, with uh, Terrence Hill, Maria Grazia Bukela, and Fernando Rey, who's in a ton of stuff. It is uh, shot in Spain, as most of these spaghetti westerns were, and predominantly Spanish cast and crew, as I learned in the extras. They said there were really only three or four Italians on the film. So I noticed while I'm watching it, there are three versions on this, which is very cool. Again, there's the Italian version that's 97 minutes. There's the English version that's 97 minutes. And each of those has that, uh, that dubbing, Italian language, English language with titles to match. And the extended Spanish version is 106 minutes, so almost 10 minutes longer. It says at the beginning of that version, which is dubbed in Spanish, in, with English subtitles, that most it it is mostly just extensions of existing scenes. So some scenes go on longer, some existing shots go on a lot longer than in the original. And I think if you add it up over the course of you know 106 minutes or 97 minutes, if you tacked 30 seconds onto multi, most of the scenes, you could easily get another nine or 10 minutes out of it. So um, it was interesting to watch because a lot of times you watch these uh, like spaghetti westerns, or as they're known in Italy, westerns, that... It's an international cast. So you have Italian speaking Italian, you have American speaking English, you have Germans, you have Spanish people. Sometimes they wouldn't even have a script, so the, the and they didn't shoot with sound, sync sound, so the director would often tell them, you know, just count to 10, then turn and walk over here and count to 11, or talk about your grocery list or whatever. So uh, lip sync wasn't always a thing in these, but this is one of the rare uh, Italian Westerns that I can recall where the lip sync is almost perfect. Like you swear they shot with sound on set, even though they didn't because most of the cast spoke Spanish, some of them dubbed themselves, and it just it was a really good dubbing team on this. So um, it looks phenomenal. And the uh, basically the idea is the movie opens, somebody shows up at the house, apartment, whatever you want to call it. It's set, we believe, I say we believe because it's not 100% clear, but from all the extras, we believe this is set in Spain in the 1920s. Even though it kind of looks like the Old West and they never really say where it's set, the themes of this refer to things that were going on in Spain at that time or a little bit later. So Spain in the 1920s, let's say, Terrence Hill and his younger brother live, not by, not, not by much, younger by a year or two, uh, live in a place and a guy shows up and gives them some money and says, I've got a job for you down south and how soon can you leave and take care of this? So Terrence Hill is very like stoic and stone-faced and serious in this. He's, he doesn't have a lot of dialogue. He's not a happy-go-lucky guy. He's a guy who's paid to do a job and he's there to do it. And it becomes clear over the course of the film exactly what his job is to do. My assumption at the beginning, and that's all I'm going to give you, is that we presume that because he goes to this town, Terrence Hill go, and his brother, they hop off a train and they split up. Terrence Hill goes into this little town that is really being uh, domineered and oppressed by a local landowner. And basically the idea of this story is uh, it was a true thing that happened in Spain where there, you basically had these peasant farmers who were ruled over by the wealthy landowners and just really kind of ground into the soil and abused by the landowners just so they could get the pittance they got for, for harvesting the grain and what have you. So Terrence Hill walks into that situation and we believe that he's there to help defend, much like the Three Amigos, there, he's there to defend them against the evil landowner and help them learn how to fight and, and win themselves their freedom. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. But as the film goes along, uh, exactly where his allegiances lie, they, they become, they're initially, you think, clear. Then they become unclear. And then they clarify in a place you didn't really expect them to go. So that's the basic story of this. It's really mostly a psychological drama. It's not really a Western. I mean, it's got, it's got, the, it's got horses and it's got guns. And it looks like the West or Spain or something like that. It's got the look and the feel of it and the music is great, but it doesn't feel as much like a Western like a, a lot of the other films on this set do, which is not a bad thing. It was still really good. It was it was a good film and interesting. Interesting for me, I first and foremost know Terrence Hill from Super Fuzz, which was, you know, Officer Dave Speed, smiley guy, and from the Terrence Hill Bud Spencer movies, and Mr. Billion and a few other things. So it's it's rare for me. I've seen some of his earlier westerns, and I guess up to this point, they hadn't really done comedy, so he was more of that serious character. So it's interesting to see him as just like this stone cold not smiling, really grim kind of serious guy. Um, one thing I will say to not give anything away. It has a very 70s ending to it. And the film starts off and there's this theme song about freedom and there are these two brothers who are going off to do their thing. And I said aloud, um, here's how this movie's going to end. And I was right bang on how this movie's going to end because it was the era and that's how they ended movies. So I'm not going to say anything more than that. Uh, apparently the film is really a Spanish uh, social commentary about the... Um, well, I already said that. <laughs> Sorry. There is some uh, interesting editing in this film. 
I thought. Um, almost Easy Rider ask him where you're cutting back and forth between like two scenes a little bit. Uh, also, like Easy Rider, there's some very effective use of non-actors as the villagers in the local, which is a late 60s, early 70s thing that I love in film. A lot of movies from that era did that. And it just makes it feel more real. It feels almost documentary-like at times, really. Uh, the special features. We have a commentary by Howard Hughes, not that Howard Hughes, which is very interesting and really fills in the gaps, in my knowledge, about the Spanish history that this film draws from and the director and a lot of the creative team behind this. You have... Uh, Campianos, Campianos, I am pronouncing it wrong. That's the thing I was trying to find earlier. The peasant farmer. Campianos Al Poder, it's a new intro by Fabio Malelli. That's 17 minutes. Days of Wrath, new interview with camera operator Roberto Deatore Pizzioli. Probably mispronounced that. That's 19 minutes. That's really interesting. He talks a lot about how movies were made back then and how they made specifically that movie at that point. Uh, they call it Red Cemetery. 2022 short film that's basically, uh, it's from Francisco Lacerda. It's a love letter to Spaghetti Western. So it's really just a short nine minute kind of mini Spaghetti Western film. I didn't love it. It felt a little silly. I, I saw what they were going for, but it just, it seemed like it's appropriate for the context of this set, but it, it didn't really add anything to me. Uh, alternate English, The Return of Trinity titles. I, or in my notes, I say Return of Trinity cash-in titles. Those were the titles that were created when this was marketed as a Trinity film, which it most certainly was not. Um, that's four minutes. And then an image gallery of nine images from the uh, German, po it's the German poster and the German lobby card set under the title of Hallelujah. It's always interesting to me too, how these films were sold internationally and how they had so many different titles. So available now, on Blu-ray, told you all that to tell you this, available now on Blu-ray, which I recommend along with the other two sets. These things are fantastic. If you love spaghetti westerns, it's worth getting because they're ones you probably haven't seen and they look and sound better than they've ever seen anywhere. Savage Guns for Italian, I got the title wrong, Savage Guns for Classic Italian Westerns, Volume 3. 